Now let us read together in the Word of God in the sequence of our Sunday morning series of studies in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah and we have reached chapter 10. You're not sure where to find Nehemiah. Just flick through your Old Testament to the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles and then you'll come to Ezra and Nehemiah and we have reached chapter 10 but the chapter really begins with the closing verse of chapter 9. And in chapter 9, there has been a rehearsal or a, or a recounting of the history of God's people, of all God's goodness to them, and all their ingratitude, and all their failure, and all their disobedience. And all this has been brought to the attention of the people, and in chapter 9 and verse 38, we read, because of all this, we make a firm covenant with God and write it down, and our princes, our Levites, and our priests set their seal to it. Those who set their seal are Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, these seem to be the civil leaders. And then from verse 2 down to verse 27, there's a list of names which would seem to be the names of the heads of the various houses. And we're not going to read all these complicated names. Verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brethren, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons in the matter of marriage. And if the peoples of the land bring in wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forgo the crops of the seventh year, the exaction of every debt, we also lay upon ourselves the obligation to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the continual cereal offering, the continual burnt offering, the Sabbath, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all that is for every aspect of the work of the house of our God. We have likewise cast lots, the priests, the Levites, and the people, for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our Father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord, also to bring to the house of our God, to the priest who ministered in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law. Notice, this is not new ideas. This has all been written in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. As it is written in the law, and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our coarse meal and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priest, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our rural towns. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levite when the Levites receive the tithe, and the Levite shall bring up the tithe of the tithes 
to the house of our God, amongst other things that points out that ministers should put in their collection, the same as everybody else. Verse 39, For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the gatekeepers and the singers and all that detail for this one end we will not neglect the house of our God. Amen, and may God bless to our hearts such a reading of his word. Now will you turn with me in your Bibles to the chapter that we read earlier in the service, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 10. And as we indicated at the scripture reading, the chapter really begins in verse 38 of chapter 9, the words, because of all this. All this that has been recorded in chapter 9. And in order to understand chapter 10, we have to go back to chapter 9 briefly in order to find the reason that led to such a constraint upon the people which brought them in chapter 10 to a significant public consecration. You may have noticed that we're going to be singing at the close of the service the hymn that begins, O happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Saviour and my God. And the hymn goes on to say, High heaven that heard that solemn vow, that vow renewed, shall daily hear. So in a sense, this is a day for decision and for dedication or, if you like, a day for rededication. And the thing that laid the constraint upon the people was this. If we look back to chapter 9 at verse 5, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Stand up and bless your God who is unchanging and unchangeable. And throughout the whole of the ninth chapter, the people were made aware of God. And I hope that has happened to all of you here this morning. When I said at the beginning of the service after the opening psalm, let us pray, I was aware of God. And I was aware of that all that was going to fall right through this service was to be in the presence of God. And so the people were made aware of God. They were made aware of the fact that they were dealing with God. And I hope we're all aware of that here this morning. And the people were made aware that in a very significant way, God was dealing with them. And God was saying to them, now, you have come to a very significant stage in your life as, 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 as people who profess my name. This, this is a crossroads, if you like. This is a dividing of the way, if you like. And God was dealing with them. And then from verse 6 of that chapter right down to verse 37, there follows a recital of God's goodness and God's blessing towards his people. God's long-suffering with them, he never wearied of them in spite of their disobedience, in spite of their perversity, in spite of their double dealings. God's long-suffering and patience persisted, and the faithfulness of God highlighted their shallow and shameful response. And when we come down to verse 36 of chapter 9, we find the people saying, Behold, we are slaves this day in the land thou gavest to our fathers to enjoy its fruit. Slaves in the land. They were no longer in, captive, in captivity in the land of Babylon. They were back in their own land. They were a people God had blessed. 
God had opened for them doors of opportunity. And they were a people who were now being made to face the fact that for some long time they had not been right with God. And I paused deliberately that you might consider whether or not you are right with God. And for a long time they had not been right in themselves. No, no evidence publicly that they weren't right, that their lives weren't right, that their behavior wasn't right. And again I pause that you and I might consider whether or not we are right in ourselves. And the people became aware of the fact that God knew all this about them, as he always does. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, is it verse 13, that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so the people became aware of what they might have been. They became aware of what they could have been as the people of God. And they became aware of what they should have been. They became aware of the extent to which they had drifted and had been disobedient. And they also became aware of the fact that although God had brought them to where they were and that God was amongst them and God was dealing with them, they became aware of the fact that it could all happen again. Because they became aware, as we must always be aware, that we never reach the stage in our spiritual development and our Christian lives, we never reach the stage when sin and backsliding cease to be possibilities, dangerous possibilities. In a very real sense, in chapter 9 we are being told of a people who had been brought to the stage of being honest with God and with themselves. And they say, because of all this, we make a firm covenant and we write it down and we put our names to it. There doesn't seem to be any suggestion when we come into chapter 10 that the people had resented either the rebuke or the challenge of chapter 9. They were rather aware of the fact that they had come to a day of decision. And they made that decision publicly. Now I acknowledge it can be done privately. But there is a real place for open and public confession of faith and for open and public commitment to the people of God and the work of God. Now I acknowledge that there are some great secret disciples. And I always think of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They were secret disciples. But at a time of crisis at the crucifixion, when the public disciples had all run away, the two secret disciples came out into the open and they risked not only their reputation but their lives and they went to Pilate and they begged the body of Jesus that they might take that body and lay it reverently in its tomb. Yes, there are some great secret disciples. 
But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 verse 32, and these are words that we always use at an admission service of new members by public profession of faith. Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But there is another very significant verse that I got drummed into me in my days in the Royal Navy when I first came in contact with some real Christians. It's in Romans chapter 10, at verse 10, and this is what it says. For man believes with his heart, and so is justified, and he confesses with his lips, and so is saved. The believing in the heart and the confessing with the mouth or with the manner of life or by some other significant action, these two belong together and give the dynamic that we need for Christian life and Christian service. And this is what was happening in Nehemiah chapter 10. They made this firm covenant and they wrote it down and they put their signatures to it. And if you were following the reading carefully, they put their signature to a very detailed and a very comprehensive and a very costly commitment to God and to his service. But what we are reading about this morning is not just public confession of faith, not just a great confirmation of our own personal faith, but a commitment to and an identification with the people of God. And for many people nowadays, this brings us into the realm, I nearly said into the business, of actually joining the church and doing so publicly, committing yourself to some ordered congregation of the people of God and making a confession of faith and a commitment in the face of the congregation. And in a sense, you stand up and bless the Lord, and you take your place among the committed people of God, and you go forward, not just as an individual Christian, but as one who is part of the people of God. And I think this is something that is very, very important, an acknowledging of both the privileges and the responsibilities of being a Christian. And one concern that I and many other ministers share is the number of evangelical Christians, younger folk and older folk, the number of evangelical Christians who are not actually members of any congregation. And some people actually boast about it. Oh, oh I, I don't belong to any congregation. And when they say that to me, I say, well, in that case, you are not a biblical Christian. And I believe that with all my heart. But there is another burden that I and many ministers share. It concerns the number of those who, in their youth and in their student days, who make a profession of faith, and who join a congregation and then when for example they leave the university or when they leave their home and their home city and have to go elsewhere for work they disappear not just from a congregation but from the whole Christian scene we have a number of names in our membership role of young folk, fellows and girls who were students, were converted. They Well, they professed to be converted. 
They were very much part of this congregation. They joined by profession of faith. And they disappear. And they do not seem to have had any thought of transferring formally their church membership from here to some other ordered congregation of God's people where they now live and work. There is a time and a place for a real commitment in terms of church membership. And I would address a question to all you younger folk here today. And I ask you to consider it. Where will you be in Christian terms five years from now or ten years from now? How firmly are you grounded? How securely are you settled? To what extent have you really committed yourself Not just to the faith of the gospel, but to the people of God. And our chapter this morning begins, Because of all this, we make a firm covenant. And quite a number of you will say, Oh, well, I've done that here in Sandyford. I sat down in that pew and I didn't feel at all comfortable. And when the time came that the names were being read out, my legs were shaky. But I stood, and before the congregation, I answered the questions that were put to me. And for some of you, you will say, oh yes, I I can still remember. We sang the hymn, O happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Some people do it in the context of an admission service, public profession of faith. Some do it, for example after the preaching at some of these great Billy Graham rallies. In our story here this morning, eh, it was all very low-key. The sheets of paper were laid out. The wording of the covenant was read. And they were told, if you would, if you would commit yourself, sign the covenant. Sign your name. In that sense, it wasn't, it wasn't a pressurized emotional occasion. But it sure was realistic. And the list of names we have, as I pointed out from verse 1 right down to verse 27, seems to indicate very possibly the heads of the various families. The head of the family signing for the whole family. No no doubt they would be standing there. Maybe somebody was supervising. Uh, Next in the queue, the family of George Philip. And George Philip would sign his name for the family. I can still recall the occasion a long time ago. It was an evening service. My wife and parents were sitting down there. And in the course of preaching, with some degree of passion... I I quoted the words of Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I happened to look down and there was wee John Philip nodding furiously. It meant so much to me, I nearly stuck. And this is what was happening on that occasion. The heads of the families were signing for the families. Now I agree that perhaps some were carried along by emotion. Who are we to criticize? Have we never been carried along by emotion? It can be dangerous, you know. Some people get carried along by emotion and get married. And then when the emotion cools down, they find they've got nothing to hold them together. Emotion can be dangerous. Some were carried along perhaps by emotion, not consciously being hypocritical, In verses 1 and 2, it seems to be the civil leaders who signed. Then verses 2 to 8, the priests. Verses 9 to 13, the Levites. Verses 14 to 27, the chiefs of the people. 
And then we come to verses 28 and 9. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levite, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding. And that's what the committees in Edinburgh have taken no notice of in their legislation with regard to children coming to the Lord's table. All who have knowledge and understanding. And this is important, you see, because it is only understanding that can counteract superstition in matters of religion. Some people think that because they've been baptized, they'll go to heaven. That's superstition. But in that 28th verse, it speaks of those who had separated themselves unto God. Set, separated themselves to be a distinct people in belief and in behavior. There was a time in our denomination and others when in the interest of evangelism people said, oh no, we, we've got to go out and show people that we are just the same as them. But in a very real sense, we are not. We don't believe the same and we don't behave in the same way. And these people separated themselves unto God in terms of belief and behavior because they were God's people. They were not their own. They were bought with a price. It's very staggering sometimes when you tell young people and older people this. You, you're not entitled to your own life. You're not entitled to do it your way. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. That's First Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. We haven't time to look, to, to look up all the references, but away back in the law of God in the book of Leviticus chapter 20, God says, You shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. You're not your own, says God, you're mine. And they separated themselves unto God. And I suppose we should ask ourselves the question, would we have signed the covenant that day? Or would we have read a deed of, oh, that, that's a bit extreme. No, no, uh, count me out. And therefore the question is, what about today? In the light of what we've been singing, for example, Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like me his praise should sing? Think of what some of us once were before God laid hold us in, of us in Christ and the gospel. Think of what some of us were becoming. Would, would, would we go back to that? Because of all this here today, would we sign the covenant to make this day a day of new beginning and new dedication and new consecration and a new separating ourselves? from all that would hinder us from being God's true people. I don't know that we've got time today to deal with it properly. There were two aspects to this covenant, and they're both held together. The first is in verses 28 to 30, a covenant a decision, if you like, that they would separate themselves from sin. And it speaks of various specific areas of life and activity. 
areas of life and activity which can open us up to God or hold us back from God or close us down in relation to God and to fellowship with God and service of God. And in verses 28, 29, and 30, it is the matter of relationships. And the issue is obedience, to walk in God's law with regard to the whole pattern of life. It is clear from Old Testament and New Testament that no Christian believer should marry an unbeliever. But it is also clear from the whole of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, that there should be nothing in our relationships that God cannot bless. We should be able to say, God, God, this is what I'm doing in my relationship just now. God, bless what I'm doing. And if God says, not in your life, then there's something wrong with your relationship. Not just, I'm not talking just about romantic relationships but work relationships and neighbor relationships and all our associations and all our activities, if they influence us away from God, ah, you see, I wouldn't let that happen. All right. If they have the effect of stealing away from us the freshness and the warmth of true Christian service. Stop. Oh, but you say, Mr. Lewis, I, I don't think that. Ah, but you see, you have to ask other people. It's quite a thing to say to a trusted friend. Do you think that I've lost something of the freshness and the eagerness that used to be seen in my Christian life. That's what they're doing here. The other element of the separation (coughs) and commitment in verse 31 following is with regard to the Sabbath. We spoke about this last evening in our study in Jeremiah chapter 17. That's just before the story of the potter. And we read that passage and we read another passage in Isaiah. Don't know that we've got time to do it today. But in being God's people, the three words, I'm talking about our own day and generation, the three words, keep Sunday special, are of great importance. Keep God's Sabbath Because it is God's institution. And just as there is presently a systematic attack on marriage and on morals, there is also a systematic attack upon the Sabbath or Sunday or the Lord's Day. Some of the commentators suggest that in Nehemiah's day there were some who had been saying, well, you know, Nehemiah, we're we're not working. Well, we're we're just buying. But you see, the whole tone of God's day was being changed as it is nowadays. And this is serious because the Sabbath or the one day in seven, call it the Sabbath or Sunday or the Lord's day, The Sabbath is something that God instituted from creation long, 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 long before the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments doesn't say, make the Sabbath holy. It says, keep it holy. In other words, don't you dare make unholy what God has made holy. And right from the beginning of creation as part of his order for the good of creation and for the blessing of men and women, God has set aside one day in seven. And I for one would like to challenge a lot of the Green Party people with their concern for pollution and conservation. Do they ever think of this? I, and as I said to the students the other day, 
Do the conservationists and those concerned with pollution, do they have any real thoughts about the pollution that is being created, for example, by the abortion system, and it is a system, and by the breakdown and the, and the devaluation of the marriage bond and of sex outside marriage? These are the things that are polluting the land as much as other things, perhaps more than other things. But here in the Sabbath, we are told that God's day has been given for our blessing, to give us an opportunity to get off the rat race and be still and know that there is God. An opportunity to focus heart and life on God an opportunity to stop and get our bearings on and our direction for life in relation to the world that is to come. And the Sabbath is given to God's people for a witness that we are God's people. And the present day Sunday, to a great extent, bears testimony to the fact that God is forgotten that God is refused and that God is resented. People have listened to the devil as they listened to the devil in the Garden of Eden. You shall not eat of the fruit of the... Oh, come on, has God said that? Surely that's denying your humanity and your fulfillment and, and your self-expression and your dignity. Not a bit of it. That's a lie of the devil. I acknowledge, as I did last night, that there is a legalistic Sabbath that is quite out of sympathy with Scripture. But listen to these words from Isaiah. It's time I was stopped. Isaiah 58, verse 13. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Oh, that, that's a word that speaks not only of individuals, but of communities and nations being lifted back out of the grimy shadows of materialism and secularism and unbelief and all the decay and generation that follows in their train. And so the people, verses 31 to 39, made their commitment to God and to his service. We obligate ourselves, says verse 35, and it's repeated later on, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruit, seeking first the kingdom of God. Verse 39, we will not neglect the house of our God. It's all very practical. Verse 32 speaks about service. Verse 33 speaks about work. Verse 34 speaks about the altar of God. I wonder if that's got a lot to do with prayer. Verse 35 speaks about the first fruits of energy. Verse 37 speaks about the tithes, the tenths that were given to God. Verse 39 speaks, is it verse 39 or er earlier? Yeah, verse 39 speaks of the gatekeepers and those who lead the singing. They were really saying, if it is for God... It must be right, and God must be first. This is a day, it was for them, it is for us. It is a day for vows and a day for commitment. For some it will be a day of conversion. For some it will be a day of coming back from backsliding. For some it will be a day of putting things right in their lives. For some it will be a day when they'll sing from their heart the closing hymn. 
and they'll bow in prayer after the benediction and they'll say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And the whole range of life and service is spoken of. And the basic principle is that last verse, we will not neglect the house of the Lord. But you know in verse 34, towards the end of the verse, it speaks about keeping things burning upon the altar of God. And when I read that, my heart went back to the story of Elijah and how on one occasion he challenged the people. And it says in the story that Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And I can still remember, because it's in my sermon notes, the first time I preached in that story here. And I said to the people, in relation to God, is there a broken down, neglected altar in your life? Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. And I pray, God, that here today, oh, not even waiting for the hymn or to, waiting to pray after the benediction, oh, how I pray that here there will be a great commitment to God. And in days to come, many of us will look back and say, that Sunday in October was my new start. Amen, and may God bless to us his word.